It's October the 29th, 2022, and this is The Future of Photography. The Future of Photography. Look who's here. Everyone, Jeremiah, Adrian, and me. Hello. 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 <laughs> how's, how's, how's everything in your, in your necks of the woods? Uh, we're, you know, we're as chaotic as we've always been as we near elections, so... Oh, that. Oh, no, no politics, no politics, sorry. No, so you did <laughs> ask. I have to cut you <laughs> off there. You did ask. Uh, so it's I was nice. hoping for some weather talk or something. I can do weather. Words. I'm British. I can talk about the weather. It's unseasonably nice here at the end of October <laughs> in the I'm UK. It's quite warm, right quite sunny. Word. We quite had nice. 21 Celsius yesterday, which is warm. So. Nice. Yeah, yeah, anyway, nice. um, let's talk about happen. today's topic. I have, uh, I, I have, I, I brought this one on because I'm in the middle of a transition here, um, which has to do with the system I'm working on, and uh, that's why why we titled the show from two to one. So you're going to Ubuntu? <laughs> uh, not quite. No. So so here's here's what happened. Um, my production system, my workhorse. Uh, was was past tense was <laughs> an iMac Pro decently sized system uh, workhorse powerful desktop system with discs connected to it and a big 27 inch screen and Ethernet hooked up to it and yeah as I said a workhorse you could, you could pretty much throw anything at that um, that you wanted eight cores, um, Intel Xeon CPU, nice, de decent tish graphics in there and stuff. So that was the, the workhorse. And I had a laptop for travel, like, and light media consumption, that kind of stuff, like limited remote work, some photo editing on the road, that kind of stuff. So that was my setup. And then the iMac Pro decided to die on me. Which is very just, unfortunate. Just decided. <laughs> Sad days. Uh, <clears throat> it, 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 yeah, I was old. Uh, that, was a, that was a system from 2017. So, yeah. Anyway, some, something in the system died. Uh, definitely somewhat repairable. But um, I, of course, immediately switched to that laptop, which is uh, 2020 M1 Mac or MacBook Air. Just tiny, but decent enough to do some work on it of course but um and and then i i <laughs> that plunged me into a big crisis because what am i going to do do i want to repair the imac pro because that's a that's a there's an intel system and as us apple users know uh, apple silicon is the way to go it's the future it's faster it doesn't heat up as much it doesn't use anywhere near the energy for the same performance and uh, uh, so and and all those all those Apple silicon based systems including their mobile systems work nicely together that's really kind of the underlying uh, foundation right now so the Intel was always a bit of a an odd one out here so um, of course I do have needs with especially with these two kind of systems, we have the the desktop system, the mobile system, and you need to sync something between them. So there's a Dropbox involved, there's an iCloud disk involved, or iCloud drive involved. Uh, there's like a ha half manual syncing of the Lightroom catalog, these kind of things. If you're on the road and you you have to, it it's a a bit of a pain to be honest. Also, the, both both of the systems need maintenance. We're talking twice the two systems to back up and keeping tabs on where what is and so on. I'm pretty sure both of you have probably had that in the past, that confusion of um, not finding things and not knowing where they are. So Certainly, yeah. yep. I, I've been there many times. So, <clears throat> so I, I looked into uh, consolidating that into one system, and that's what I'm doing right now. So this is the, <laughs> this is the transition. Um, and I decided to, to do that, to put everything on a laptop, which um, these tiny <laughs> laptops are powerful. <laughs> so I looked into would, 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 an, would a, like a MacBook Pro or something 
be able to replace the iMac Pro? Yes, easily. Then I looked at, well, you know, I have an M1. It's two years old. And that is as fast as the iMac Pro. So, hmm, maybe I could go with something reduced in capabilities, but still better than the, the iMac Pro. So I ended up choosing an M M2 Air, which just given just given the development over those years that has the same chip as the latest iPads so <laughs> this is a production system that's more powerful than my old old 8 core iMac Pro which in itself was a beast um but now i only have to <clears throat> to sync between the laptop the laptop is the main system now so i only have to sync between the laptop and my mobile devices pretty much so most of that goes happens fully automatically. Um, there's a big iCloud drive gluing everything together. Um, but for production purposes, for the studio work and everything, I will still need something local. So I looked into clamshell mode. You can run these systems just closed and hooked up to a keyboard, a mouse, a little docking thing that has all the microphone and uh, things connected to it. So that works very well. Um, and the nice thing about the M2 Air is it's fanless. Which I was is say, kind of I the think most, it has any fans in it. This is the it, most so. mind-blowing thing about this. The <laughs> iMac Pro, even though that was very powerful, it had a fan, it was pretty silent, but you could still every now and then when it was doing like big renders and stuff like that, you could still hear... Vroom, the fan uh, spinning up and this thing is dead silent so that is that is where I'm right now I have I am I'm in the middle of consolidating things now I do have a few issues of course that thing has a 13 inch screen I'm coming from a 27 inch screen so even doing a production like this with like five six windows open is a bit confusing so but it'll drive a big screen. It'll drive a big screen, um, which is uh, <laughs> which is a cost factor at this point because sure. the only the only screen that for me really would make sense is the five K uh, studio display, which is fifteen hundred bucks. That so. sounds expect. That sounds like it'd be cost <clears throat> better I was than gonna, the laptop. I, I was actually going to recommend another screen, but it's more expensive. Well, uh, give. <laughs> Don't talk the about ISO and all these no, other... No, the, the BenQs are particularly good because they'll match exactly what's on your color eyes well, I'm talking about. And, and they are beautiful. And uh, I've been really happy with the panels that are in, in Apple products. So um, yeah. I, 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 come from, I come from Windows. I used to be... Um, Twice a year, I used to do a, a calibration of the display. I've never had to do any of that. Uh, yeah, I, I think then. for most purposes, it's funny because I'm about to start printing some of my newer work, and I did a calibration yesterday. They, you know, they, it's kind of common and it's it's lovely, but the Apple displays are very bright, very contrasty, very saturated, very pop, and um, they're good for kind of eye candy and just surfing and, and doing all of that stuff. But when you're trying to set up ICC profiles and trying to move stuff over, you need a more balanced look. The thing about these BenQs is you can go from sRGB to RGB to Mac. You know, just they have buttons and it'll just change the dynamic. And once you've kind of calibrated it, it it's really accurate, really beautiful and hooks up with no problem also has sort of a built-in hub. But I digress. <laughs> <laughs> you and you're suggesting something that something that's even more expensive. Thanks yeah, for that. <laughs> it, but it, it did like I worked with a system. I had the Intel finally, and I I did the same thing until the M1 um, right. Mini came along. Then I I bought that, and that's what I've been using, and love it. And and I have a MacBook M1. So yeah, Air, which is fantastic. Also so now. That's all. Of course, this uh, this uh, consolidation also is risky, right? So far, I had uh, the the main workhorse and the laptop, and I in this situation I actually had a fallback to use, which I won't have then because that will that'll be my only system. So yeah, 
How I've, how I, have you have you uh, gotten rid of the older laptop as well? Then I will. I will. Ah, okay. I, I really want this to be one single system for everything for the travel. That that laptop has a two terabyte SSD in it, so it's big enough to hold whatever I need it to hold. Every, everything you're saying is absolutely great, fabulous, uh, simple, and wonderful uh, until you have a glitch. <laughs> well, and that's and that's the thing. So I looked at how to mitigate those. That risk, that main risk of the one system, I don't know, being stolen on the road or being run over by by a by a truck, or just huh? a piece of software that you put in there that kind of self adjusts. Right. Uh, that's more likely. So I have a strategy, and uh, I, I had this in the past, and it worked really well. And that is that um, first of all, there will be a nightly backup, like not just a backup, but a clone of the disk. So mm -hmm. what that means is if uh, if that SSD should die, I can unplug or plug in the external one and just start up again. I had to use that in the past and that uh, that works that works well, even though it's not as fast because that would be a spinning disk, but still um, definitely workable. Um, the other one is um, I've looked online. How quick could I get a rental M2 MacBook Air? Hmm. That would be here in a couple of days, and it's fifty bucks per month. So, that would be uh, a, a quick a quick solution to bridge uh, the time when something needs to be repaired. So, that works okay. And then, last but not least, um, even though it is a cost factor, but Apple Care, it does make sense. Oh, yeah. it does make sense. Can, can, can I can I challenge you a bit, Chris? Go ahead on this because I, I have some questions. It's really it's really intriguing. So uh, I I am also fortunate enough to have an M1 chip laptop. Um, uh, mine is a relatively basic spec uh, MacBook Pro from when the M1 chips first came out, and it just flies. And anything I've ever thrown at it, it's just dealt with. So my question, my first question is, what was unsatisfactory about your existing m1 based laptop that you needed to buy the m2 because um when i bought it two years ago i bought the lowest possible spec M macbook air m1 we're talking uh eight gigabytes of ram which is good for most of the things but sometimes it turns out to be a bit uh limited because then it'll if you run several things at once you have it, it goes into swapping and uh and slows down a bit and wears out the SSD. And the lowest spec one has a 256 gigabytes SSD. Uh, and okay. that so, is so, way too small. So it wasn't so much the the power available in the CPU, wasn't yeah, it was it was more the rest of the kit that's wrapped it was around the, it. Mostly the RAM and the and the SSD. I bought the smallest one because first of all I wanted it quickly and that was the 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 quickest one available. And second, um, this was never meant to replace my workhorse system yeah. this was a travel system so okay because i'm pretty sure anything that i do my laptop would just handle without any bother at all with probably without even putting the fans on to be honest but well, if you had one uh, and yes and if, if you have a 16 gigabyte and uh and enough ssd then yeah I there's no reason what to i've got to be honest should i have a look let's see what it says <laughs> it about about this mac it says uh it's an m1 mbp 13 inch from 2020 uh, it does have 16 gig I obviously put some right. some ram in it uh, storage 256 so i've only got the basic storage but a lot of my stuff lives in the cloud anyway so but yeah i can I've, imagine if yeah. you were doing only, plenty of video only, editing and stuff like that you'd end yeah, up with the, the issues yeah. i've had have all been around rendering <laughs> Well, the, the the M2 is is slightly faster than the M1. It's not it's not really groundbreaking, groundbreakingly faster, but it's faster. And uh, the the amount of video that I render and conversions that I do between formats and these kind of things, like there's a there's almost almost always some FFmpeg running to to do a conversion of video, crunching the numbers, that kind of stuff um, is. It, it benefits from that system, definitely does. So, and it's the current system. It's the newest chip. It's the it's the fastest one they have, and um, it 
if I if I want to sell this thing, then I better have something decent to sell, you know. <laughs> yeah, well, hopefully it will last you a good few years. Well, That's it'll last the you plan. Five, six, seven years. Oh, I, I've I've never run a system under seven, six, seven years. Yeah, I usually I tend to wear them out and then get get something good again. So yeah. anyway, this is this is my journey right now. The consolidation, um, which on the one hand has some inconveniences, the smaller screen, the it's everything. Right now, I'm still it's very provisional what I'm doing here. There's also also the reason we changed the visual format because that was not on the disc that I had. Uh, on the M1, and now I found it's actually quite convenient to do it uh, in a slightly different way. So um, things actually—it's a lot of change in some respects. I have a lot of like I had a whole barrage of external disks and SSDs hooked up to that uh, to that bigger system because it had all the I/O and the smaller one. Now I'm working with a hub, and it's kind of difficult to get enough ports. So I'm consolidating now and. And uh, um, moving around like a terabyte or two of data is takes its time, you know. <laughs> well, that, that, that's for sure. Uh, yeah. You know, the, the you know I have plugged in four drives currently into this system, and um, and these drives I alternate in terms of backups, which is that's essential for me. So I I, I do a time machine backup every two days. I do a a backblaze uh, backup uh, every two days as well, just alternating because the the time machine backs up the entire system, where back backblaze just backs up your data. Um, but one is kind of more local backup. The time machine is local backup, and the backblaze obviously is cloud backup. Plus, I have Dropbox plus iCloud. I'm obsessed because I like riding a motorcycle. I always say. It's either down or it's going down. <laughs> have you ha, have have any of you ever had some like disastrous data loss? Because I did years ago. It's, I'm I'm a bit on the same side. I've rather over than under backup. Um, years ago, I had a I lost an entire hard drive with like half a year's worth of photos on it, which for some stupid reason was not in a backup, even though I thought it was. So. I think Half I, I, think I carry a, a different definition of uh, of essential backup or, or disastrous loss th than other people. Uh, I, I know that people care. A lot of people care very deeply about their their photos and, and other things. Um, I think if if I was to lose six months worth, I'd probably just shrug it off. It's you know, in the end, I did too because I had no choice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but so, so that's a bit different, though. It's, it's like yes, so so yeah. Part of me would think, oh, okay, well, there's a, there's the six months gone there. But what? Uh, maybe it's because maybe I'm just in a luxurious position that none of my work, that none of my photography, for example, is is commercial work for clients or anything like that. So so there's no there's no business loss there, um, and also I don't know. I have. Uh, you know, I, I have many tens of thousands of photographs of stuff. If I was to lose a few thousand, I probably wouldn't bother me that much. I'd I don't know. I'd weep openly. Uh, the the um, I mean, my my I I have at Knockwood lost uh, photographs. I still have floppy disks, not floppy disk, but um, DVDs. You know, from two thousand and four. Somewhere in a you know bank vault of early work, everything is now pretty well consolidated to my uh, Lightroom catalog. And by the way, the Lightroom catalog, which I back up also daily, but I have a clone of it on a, one of those um, very tiny wafer thin drives for going away. And what I found is, uh, if you clone it or if you copy it exactly and label it exactly the same as you label your drive, you just it's plug and play, where whatever system you are. I'll find it, address it, and you'll have your Lightroom catalog right there. So um, that's always worked for me as a road machine because sometimes I am spending four or five, six months on the road, not, sometimes even years. And and so I, f I found that that system in terms of protecting one's photo is back up your drive, but also clone your drive, put it away safe, make sure it's up to date. When you go on the road, you can just take that little drive 
and it'll work. The other thing is basically capture another drive, all new work there, unless you're accessing old work. And just when you're back, just copy it all over in terms of another, you know, another folder, another file, another collection, whatever, whatever you want. But um, backing up photos is obviously important to me. So, so I'd be interested in hearing your your stories of consolidation. My nice. stories. Oh, well, oh, oh, Adrian, oh, oh, oh. you you said you said you you had you had this phase where you consolidated a lot of things onto the uh, onto that ecosystem just for photography and so on. Yeah. So you, you, you switched over uh, quite a bit. Has that worked out for you? Uh, so general? far, yeah. So I have, uh, I use my iCloud photo library as my main storage. Um, there's close to 100,000 photos and videos in it at the moment. Uh, and uh, that is the, uh, I guess in some ways it's the primary store. Um, I have now got to the point where so so and I let all my devices do that thing that Apple says is oh let Apple manage your disk space. So <laughs> at any point in time, I don't really know what's on my hard drive. Just that there's enough to do what I'm doing day to day, and so, and, it, uh, and and the machines will just clear out if they need to clear out. Um, so in that sense, it's the primary store is is in the cloud. Um, I do have uh, a, a RAID drive or two uh, here in the house. Um, which I have now, um, one step I took earlier this year was I, I created a way to, uh, to, to, to download from the cloud uh, the full library so that I do have a full local copy of it on hard Your, your photo library. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, but what I've what I've done is I've set up the RAID drive as um, I got as a system drive. So I use it as an external system drive. And if I boot up from that, then the iCloud photo library is also on that RAID store. And I've got that system set up to download all of the iCloud f photos and, and videos so that I can have all of that locally stored on hard drives. Why is that? Don't you trust the cloud? <laughs> 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 I think I think you're you're just trying to have a go there, aren't you? Because you know clearly I'm the one <laughs> with the least depth in my backup strategy. Or do you have a Drobo raid? Could they just it's, oh, so, oh, oh, uh, don't get me started <laughs> about Drobo. I I know, they are. I think they're Lassi, um How what do they big somethings? Yeah. I can't remember. There is an aluminium enclosure. Each of them has two drives in it, which are hot also ra raid. raids are. Ex you know they are. They're a lot more dangerous than you think because if the if the master disk if if all of the I forget what the term is but if you have one glitch in the there's there's assign, there's different there's different kinds of raids and uh, yeah. some of them are are quite safe and c take care of your data and with with like sometimes with double redundancy so you can lose more than one drive and that is fine yeah. and then there's the so-called striped so raids, where you where you have two discs yeah, that exactly. act as one, and the, those are usually called scary raids because scary. one glitch will kill yeah. the entire Minor thing. Setup I, 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 have I forget that, what I've the raid problem, which I is why I bought a Drobo. Yeah, mirroring is raid level one, so you okay. should be fine. So, but so I have that. And they're hardware, they're hardware controlled raid as well in in these enclosures, yeah. not software controlled raid as well. So, which I understand is a bit more robust. But to be honest, I haven't had any bother. I haven't lost anything. Um, and it, it's probably, it's certainly enough backup for me because, yeah, when I consider the, the amount of effort and cost of my backup systems versus the amount of pain, if I was to lose them, it's, it's more than enough. Um, so yeah, I think the, the, I, I often wonder, and, and this is what I say, I sometimes carry a, a, sometimes I think I carry a different definition of disaster because to me it wouldn't be a disaster and and i know that uh, but but i know that for a lot of people it would be really really troubling to them either psychologically or economically or a bit of both um if they were to lose their or creatively i suppose if they were to lose their archives um but for me it would be a well, speaking, yeah. oh well of, move on speaking of anecdotal issues about backups uh, i use i uh, i have a certain amount of stuff that's in dropbox i use dropbox as well as iCloud. And uh, about three days ago, four days ago, I was installing a new piece of software and I got this message, boom, on my screen. Uh, I can't, you know, we can't 
<laughs> we can't um, install this. Your system has run out of memory. Whoops! It's like what? I've got, I've got a you know at least uh, two terabytes in here or terabyte. I forget. Um, one terabyte, and um, so I ran a Daisy disk just to, to see, and it said that like half of my uh, half of my memory was taken up by Dropbox, and I had set it to be cloud only but when i think when i kind of updated the mac system some it, you know it turned that switch off and so everything that was on my my dropbox was now on my computer and i had literally 500 megabytes left mm. <laughs> quite that's quite dangerous quite scary against, too yeah yeah, so I immediately kind of had to consolidate, went through the switches, and I had to literally on every file re reestablish cloud only, and uh, and then of course with the, and it took because it had to resync all of the data, and within I don't know, it took like thirty six hours and. You know, boom, I had 500 gigs back on my, or 400 gigs back on my memory. <laughs> so, you know, I don't know. Um, it's all fun and games until somebody loses an eye, right? Yeah. But I'll tell you, I'd say, it's, yeah, absolutely. So, so let me ask you guys a question, because one of the things I like about my setup is that if I'm traveling... Uh, I can take a card out of my camera. I can get my little dongle either for my phone or my iPad or if I have a laptop with me, you know, a card reader and I can install it. Uh, I can uh, download into the into the device and at some point it will start uploading that up to the Internet and I don't need to worry about it. But that means that when I'm on the road, even if I've only got a phone, I've got two copies of all my images because I can take the card out of the camera at the end of the day and just take a copy onto my phone. Do you guys have any yeah. equivalent of that or do you or, or, or is it you always take laptops around with you? Um, no, for I, for I, me, I, it's, I for me, it's the laptop. For me, on the road, it's the laptop. That's why I'm so happy about this big system because it's big in, internally, externally. It's a MacBook Air, so it's not big. Yeah. Um, so it's easy to transport. It slips into a backpack easily, and uh, it might have an external drive. Um, and then if I'm on the road and I take pictures and I uh, I, I import to the, them to the system. I leave them on the uh, on the SD cards in the camera, as well. So that yeah. is an implicit backup. And um, and then when I get home, uh, I I used to have then to transfer things into a catalog. But uh, I'd I'll have a mobile catalog here that uh, works just fine. Actually, it's the actual catalog. Mm -hmm. Just that uh, most most of my pictures, because we're talking two to three terabytes of raw files which don't fit right. this but um i'll have i'll have smart previews with me um that i can use on the road and then the big one on the nas here back home so that connects in nicely and uh adding photos onto the local catalog and then moving them over to the nas is not a big deal and everything is in the backup so it's I a it's well it's a very well a working system with one computer with two computers hey it's you keep forgetting to move things around and it's it's a pain anyway um yeah so that's my story of consolidation right now uh, it's, oh, it's not luck. it's not fully finished yet but um it is it is getting there and the plan is pretty clear so it's nice to see you smiling again Right, so for the for, for listeners, <clears throat> listeners and viewers won't quite have fully appreciated, I guess, just how much have, stress have this has caused you. Just how much stress this has caused you. Even doing something relatively simple in our lives, like recording an episode of the Future of Photography. I think you know. Also, gear-wise, uh, you know, uh, there's probably an argument to be made to consolidate and simplify gear. Um, you know, whether one looks at one's gear as different tools, brushes, uh, colors uh, to take different kinds of intended images or, um, you know, is it better to just kind of settle on one camera, one lens and one point of view? And that, that's a kind of, a, you know, I go through different phases, I, I should say, where I will just use a single camera. 
um, or no camera, as I've been doing over the last, you know, uh, year, for example. Um, but I'm about to travel, you know, to the deep south, Antarctica, with a lot of gear, as much gear as I can muster, uh, because I don't really know what kind of, of situation I'm going to encounter. You know, I certainly want to take some film camera, 120. I'm not going to take a larger format, but I'll take my 69 uh, Fuji, which is pretty good. You know, that's pretty nice size negative, uh, half the size of a 4x5, and I can wear it around my shoulders. So I like that. Plus, I'll take a Leica and my smartphone, which I assume I'm going to take most of my pictures with. But, uh, you know, who, who, who knows? I'll bring a laptop as well and, and, and do that. But, um, uh, you know, it should be very, very interesting. Uh, you know, um, I was going to bring a drone, but I, I don't I'm think not sure I can. you can fly it down there. No, you can't. I found out. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Pengu <laughs> Penguins are definitely anti-drones. So. Pretty much, um, yeah. So that's that. Uh, but... Um, again, consolidation of gear, I think, sharpens the mind also, makes one focus more on the, on the picture process of taking it rather than what lens should I use. I always am amused when I see people with all kinds of camera bags and they're changing if, if lenses. You, if, you were, if you were 20 years younger, I would probably ad advise you to not take as much gear with you to Antarctica, but um, you You've done this before, so I, I have, and it's not <laughs> as much gear as you think. It it it'll it'll a small little go bag, yeah, uh, with everything I could fit in that bag, which is just gear. So even if I reduced the amount of cameras, I wouldn't reduce the size of the bag. So sounds think, reasonable. <laughs> you know, it's really how much film to take, and you know the you know there's yeah. Sure, consolidation I consolidation I, th I think is important but then of course I also know this is not going to be the system for the rest of my life so um, things will change but I hope to get to get this in a, into a stable form for at least five years so that's yeah. the goal well well the things change probably four years is probably where you're gonna end up because things change so rapidly now uh, the, the kind of improvements and software is just becomes more and more and more um, engorged shall we say right <laughs> uh, and, and, and so you go like wow this is so fast that was running last year's Microsoft Word this year's Microsoft Word you know uses a, you know massive amount so it really depends on, on your relationship with the software. I mean, you know, Adobe is always kind of adding, updating, and, and doing very interesting things, both with their neural and their, their just their general Lightroom at, uh, Lightroom has just received a bunch of new AI-based selection tools. Absolutely so, yeah. fantastic. I've used them. And uh, in fact, some of my newer work, I've used them extensively. Very impressive. I mean, anything that doesn't uh, require you to go from Lightroom to Photoshop is fantastic for basic stuff like masking or selections and whatnot. And you start to use Photoshop, at least I do, for layering. Um, and, and, you know, I'm also using Skylum um, Neo, you know, which we can talk about that another week. But that, that is a dazzling, dazzling piece of, of photo editing software. All right. I think I think this takes us nicely into our picks of the week because we'll want to start with the first one. Uh, that is also AI related. Adrian, <laughs> take it away. Uh, well, this is an interesting story that I, I saw. I think it came out in the summer. Um, uh, and, and just to make life difficult from a production element, uh, Chris, I've added a second pick based on the conversation of the last minute as well. Um, so uh, this story is uh, about the French government and Google working together uh, to identify using AI. So using computer vision AI to identify the location of private swimming pools uh, in French people's gardens, essentially. <laughs> um, because uh, French swimming pools are a taxable item. And so this is actually the French government trying to make sure they're getting as much tax as they need, because, of course, like many countries, uh, French people installed a great deal, uh, a great number of swimming pools during all the lockdowns when everybody was forced to stay at home. Uh, so uh, this is um, 
uh, this was just an interesting story, which I think I think we were all aware of it, but I don't think we've mentioned on this particular and they podcast. used ai to find them right they did yeah working with google <laughs> google maps uh, or google satellite imagery um to, to to find i guess it's the little blue rectangles isn't it that's the giveaway well, right well I, I i read about this story a couple of weeks ago and the the initial efforts they made there was uh were, were not as successful because there were a lot of miss identifications especially like solar farms that kind of stuff that look very much like swimming pools from above so just imagine send, massive tax bills sending a massive tax bill to someone because they have a bunch of solar panels in their garden so well you know ai isn't the answer to everything is it or is no it? it's not so your your second pick um Dark so my Cross. second pick was prompted just by the conversation in the last minute and a half actually uh it reminded me uh, and you'd asked about consolidation so it links to this right. uh, so i used the app dark room um uh, on started off using it on my phone because it was able to process uh things like raw files from my old uh, iphone 12 pro whatever it was that i had um, but many people might not know uh, two things that are interesting one is that if you uh, subscribe to dark room now which is 20 somethings a year and um, uh, you also get um, ai masking so it can select foreground background sky people that sort of thing automatically and it also because uh, going going to the apple silicon thing it also now works uh, on the uh, the macbooks as well on, on apple on macs in mm. general as long as they've got an m chip in them uh, so a bit like LumaFusion does for video editing, you know, the, as m many people will know that, a very powerful uh, non-linear editor for video that started out on the iPad and iPhone and now works natively on a Mac. Uh, Darkroom does the same for processing of images, including all sorts of selective adjustments and AI masking. So there you go. There's, there's just an extra data point for everybody. AI getting, getting his foot in every single door. Um, Jeremiah, you brought us... Uh, Something that <laughs> that we've looked at before, just briefly, but now it's finished. It, yeah, I've I've it's finished uh, probably for the next six months or so. The, but this is the the new Tinroof dot studio um, website, uh, which features uh, yours truly's work in AI and uh, some uh, procedural or generative work as well. Um, some Unreal Engine work. Um, and all basically completely made up of a photo sensibility applied to, uh, you know, polygons, uh, generative code, and um, AI. And you're saying you're making this all up, these it's artist all, types. It's all invented, and I encourage everybody to take a trip down <laughs> into my weird world of uh, exploration of the dawn tin of roof dot studio or can can i can i ask where this tin roof moniker comes from well my company name is tin roof inc and that came from a, one of those moments where you had to you know you're registering a company which when you register it's like you know 011465 california <laughs> whatever it is and uh, the account said we need a name for the company just give me a name quickly. I got to register today. And it was the first thing that came into my head, sort of cat on a hot tin roof or tin roof or the sound of rain on a tin roof. I just felt it had a sort of visceral sense. So I just threw that out. And now it, for years and years and years, decades now, it is my company. And um, I, I separated the tin roof dot studio to the tin roof dot com, which is more photo stuff virtual mm -hmm. um you know virtual street photography as you know or in-game photography as well as classic camera work uh, on uh, on that one so i i it's not that the twain never meet but they are very different kind of work but from the same point of view anyway that's it all right you're all, you're all invited <laughs> good yeah, very quick story before we get that last thing uh, on company names i 20 odd years ago um i i had a company um and in the uk you can buy, sort of buy them off the shelf and with just that people are pre-registered and so we chose the silliest one on the list me and my new business partner which happened to be called golden monkey 
Um, <laughs> and we were delighted with this name while we, while we were it bought us some time to sit yeah, before we chose the proper branding for our new business. Um, and we were delighted with it until we actually went to visit a potential customer and had to tell them the name of the company. It's like, what company mm. are you from? We're from Golden Monkey. Oh, no, that was a really bad choice. <laughs> <laughs> they, they, they probably didn't take you quite as seriously as you are. Probably not. No. They're, in, they're in the heroin business. <laughs> Golden Monkey. Sounds like sounds like an interesting cannab cannabis strain or something. Yeah, exactly. You know, from the uh, Golden Triangle, monkey on your back. We get it. All right. So for my pick, um, I have to do this in a bit of a roundabout way. First of all, question to, to the both of you. We, we have now uh, figured out that we are all firmly rooted in the Apple ecosystem, which also means we all have iPhones. Um, do you guys have favorite cameras, camera apps on the iPhone that you like to use that are not the stock photo app? Yeah. Okay, what would you, what would you say if you could... Just Adrian, you are you you you're silent. No, no, I do. I was just going to let Jeremiah yeah. go first. Oh, I see, no, I'm not going to say there's there's many. It but, doesn't matter which one, but but, but but by the by the way, Lightroom's camera is fantastic. Just right. So FYI. the the thing is, um, it is very difficult, if not impossible, to uh, replace the convenience of getting to the default built-in camera. Uh, as in, you can start it from the lock screen, right? You you can start it from the lock screen, and then go. Okay, so so there are ways to do that um, to start that. Uh, Jeremiah, you just made a tapping gesture, so you use the the uh, accessibility shortcut to tap on the back of the phone. That's right. That is one way to do it. There's another way where you can uh, create a shortcut with with app, with iPhones or iOS built-in shortcut system where you have like if camera app starts like the default camera app start another one so ah, whenever you tap that button on the, or press and hold the button on the lock screen it will start the normal camera and then quickly switch to your camera of choice but then that's the only camera you can start from the lock screen what would you say if you could start any camera app from the lock screen with one I'd tap say i'd want that Yes, <laughs> that's that, for me. That's a bit of a game changer because uh, when I'm out and about, I want to, I don't know, have Argentum up or Halide or something like yeah, that. Exactly. And uh, but also, I don't want to lose that ease of just using the built-in app because that is also good for a lot of things. So um, with iOS 16, Apple has added widgets on the lock screen. So right under the clock, there is there are four slots for four individual widgets. And if a camera manufacturer builds in a widget for their own software, then that can live in there and you can tap it and you can start that app. So Pro Camera is an example. They have a widget for the lock screen. So if you have Pro Camera, you can start it from the lock screen by tapping on the widget. But that doesn't help you if you use something like, let's say, Argentum, which I do, because um, that does not come with the widget. Um, but I found something and that is called Lock Flow. And Lockflow is a little tool that allows you to create shortcuts that either, or widgets that either launch an app or they launch a shortcut. And you can put these on your home screen. So you could have on these, in these four widget slots, you could have four different cameras and plus the, the, the proper built-in camera so you could you could have five you could choose from five different camera apps on your home screen and launch them using Lockflow. it's a bit uh, it's a bit convoluted to set it up but if you've done it once it'll it'll be just fine and uh, with the new lock screen paradigm where you can have multiple lock screens you could have a i'm out and about to take pictures lock screen with all your favorite camera apps on and then you could have another lock screen for your everyday whatever where, where you have your weather and stuff like that on there as widgets oh, so that, that is, is isn't that a game changer yes it, so it, what it do is. they call multiple lock screens i have it but i haven't used it Oh, the lock screens are already built in uh, in iOS 16, and the app that you can use to launch and create these widgets is called Lockflow. So, I, uh, so the the thing I was going to say, one of my favourite cameras, uh, as we all know, is Hipstamatic, and the the Hipstamatic X app actually has one of these new app uh, shortcuts. So, widgets. I I have a, a Hipstamatic uh, starting 
icon on the lock screen of, of my phone. But if your favorite cameras don't offer that, lock exactly. flow is yeah, the way no, around. Is, and so you can really good, yeah. You so. can launch any app from the lock screen. And it's easier than launching the built-in one because to launch that, you have to press and hold. And I guess some of them you'd be able to choose your favorite lens as well because some of the of some of the more sophisticated apps allow you to you know save settings or something yeah. like that. Yeah, don't know sure. for which which lens you boot up into, as it were. Sure. So with the widget system, which I'm pretty sure was originally meant to display information, is now becoming a, a, a camera launcher. And so I'm you could have it. Argentum, right? Then, but you could have it with like three separate icons for like the ultra wide, the wide, and the telephone. I'm not sure that is possible. I think Argentum has to enable that. I think they have ah, to. Okay. But uh, as I'm as I only use one filter anyway, um, the Ansel Adams lookalike filter. <laughs> um, in Argentum, that's I just need to launch it, and now I can. See, uh, by the way, just sidebar because there is so much discussion about AI and training models and using other artists, photographers, etc., in the model, uh, and 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 this kind of how come artists are not being paid if their styles are being used <laughs> or abused in many cases, and you know that's a conversation for another day, but. Um, Nobody seems to be having that conversation with photographic style integration um, into apps. I, I, I find that to be somewhat amusing, if not hypocritical. Anyway. You're a bit, a bit beyond me there. What, what, what apps are doing that then? Oh, there apps Argentum that... imitates the look that Ansel Adams Oh, I see the answer. Sorry, example. yes, you're right. Yeah. You just said it, didn't you? Yeah. Is it, yeah, okay. but if I, if I went and, and say, you know, did a said, I want to do a mountain range in the style of Ansel Adams as a prompt. Yeah, but there, it takes a bit more than just having a filter on uh, there, you know. So. Yeah, well, and it takes more anyway, than and just but, writing a prompt. Another day, we will get into that. And by the way, I'm pretty sure that... Um, that what it, what we just talked about the launching of different cameras from lock screen is a very very Apple specific issue because I'm pretty sure all the Android users who listen to this roll their eyes and go we've had that for ten years <laughs> probably, probably yeah, <laughs> yeah uh, among other things <laughs> anyway I think we are ready to close this episode uh, I hope that we had a few useful things in there for you. Um, that block flow thing, that lock screen launcher, is really the big, the big winner. This this made this made my entire week when I found that out. Yeah, that's good. I'm so, all over it in about five minutes. Yes. So I do have I do have a camera based lock screen that launches all sorts of different cameras and apps and stuff. So. There we go. Um, we are online at thefuturephotography.com or. Uh, on Twitter at TFOP now. We'll be back in a week. Until then, everyone, take care and bye bye. Have a good one. And there's the outro. <laughs>